Does the world make space for artists? You know, <laughs> yes, they do, and no, they don't. And how, okay, how do you answer this question? How do I mean? So, art is literally a part of everybody's everyday life. The hard part about that is letting, making someone, helping someone realize that they are living in among art and the product of artists at all times. Um, perfect example is what we have right in front of us. This right here is the product of several artists. Yes, committee, but the first artist who ever drew the design of a shoe like this, because not shoes didn't always look have this shape and weren't always tennis shoes. That is an artist. The first person who ever drew an animated cartoon, a mummy that is a villain, an artist. The person who decided to put these things together, choose the colors, all that, art, like the, the presentation of it, artist. The table that we like have this stuff on, artist, designer. Like the, the, the way our cameras look, the way our watches look, tattoos, buildings, cars, artists, not just paintings on walls, you know. So the world, yes, creates space for artists, but when there's a person who's like, I want to do art, that is something you just look at. What's the name of these shoes? These shoes are the Thundercat collaboration with Puma. Uh, these particular ones are the Mumra. I don't know the exact, like they got a, a serial number, but it's called Mumra and it's based on the villain from the Thundercat series who was a, a mummy who become this big hulking monster when he called on the ancient spirits of his ancestors basically. And so they made the shoe to look like the old mummy with the cloth bandages and his skin color and the color of his robes and he even has like a little um it's got his symbol and it's got his face on the lenticular that changes when you uh shift your foot so you can see his the old mummy face and his symbol actually yeah I am a Am I a fan of Mumra? I am a fan of Mumra. I have actually, strangely enough, even though I'm not in my villain phase anymore as a human being, um, I have really started to collect, started to collect villains and iconic villains in particular. And I feel like Mumra is a great example of an iconic villain because we always root for the Thundercats, but the Thundercats are underdogs. They're the rebels. They, there's no real way they could possibly actually win when Mumra's at full power because he's immortal, he's ever living, and the, his only weakness is his reflection. Ah, childhood. What brought Mumra into my life? So back when I was a little kid, back when, you know, cartoons were first really, I wanna say in the 80s, like, when cartoons were first really used as 30 minute commercials to sell toys um, there were two three cartoons that like dominated everything that I love uh, there was He-Man there was of course Transformers and there was the Thundercats which was a clone of He-Man and I loved the Thundercats I, it was something about these cat people and Lionel with the swords and just Anything with swords, really, when I was a kid, I loved. So, yeah, of course, Voltron was up in there because he had the blazing sword. And He-Man, of course, with the sword of power. But, like, Lino and the Thundercats with Mumra, I mean, each of the Thundercats had a cool power. They were all called to this thing. They were royal. Then you got the leader who was a little kid with a grown-up body who's got super strength. And a villain who is an Egyptian mummy. You know, you learn about sort of Egyptian culture in a way because through Thundercats especially if you look at all the animals are like human shape with animal heads like Egyptian mythology it's very dope 
but you know it took me growing up realizing that like yeah they were priming me for being in, into Egyptian mythology oh do I think the world needs heroes that is <sighs> the world needs examples is what it needs um the I am a I am a student of nerd culture, superhero stuff. I've been all my life, um, and of course, mythological heroes, things like this. And you know, as we get into more modern thought and more modern ideas, where things aren't as black and white as they used to be when we we're younger, the idea of a hero to me has changed because when a person declares themselves a hero, is it's a little bit self-aggrandizing. And then you have to think about what is their motivation for being a hero. Um, conventionally, I'm sure the definition of hero is a person who will go above and beyond to do what is right. But what is right? What is right for this group of people might not necessarily be right for, you know, all groups of people. So do we need heroes? Mm. No, we need examples. We need humans to be extra human and to understand that well yeah we need people with empathy and who are allowed the empathy and sympathy to uh, carry them as they deal with other people that's what I think um, if you'd asked me this question maybe two three years ago I'd say yes a hundred percent um In a way, I feel like sometimes, sometimes, a person needs to be taught a lesson. Not, and I don't think, you know, they need to be taught that lesson until they die. They need the opportunity to learn it. And sometimes the only way you can get taught a lesson is through physical pain, punishment. Um, but that should always be like a last an extreme resort when all other things have been exhausted, when all other opportunities for growth and change have been, you know, taken away. Uh, you know, and, and we watch people beat up, get beat up and murdered and whatever in movies and it's entertainment. Um, and for adults, yeah, we hopefully we're thinking we understand like, yeah, this is a fantasy it shouldn't be handled necessarily like this isn't the best way to handle the situation uh it's it's a hundred percent of fantasy and we just hope we don't carry those lessons from fantasies in real life because it's fun to watch you know but i don't think that is like should be anyone's first first solution these things are neat uh, have I ever had to be a hero? I mean, back in the day, I have done things that uh, some would consider heroic, you know. Um, and I'm not saying, like, and if I'm physically capable, I might still do things like that. But at the end of the day, incredibly foolish. Like, it, it's crazy to chase a, a person that's stealing purses into dark alleys through traffic. It is... You know, it is, you know what, let me retract. I have been an example. Um, I have been a person who, when I see people in situations where they could be taken advantage of, I have stepped in and either pulled them away from those situations or, you know, interfered with the person that was trying to take advantage. Um, and if, if you want to call that heroic, sure. Uh, otherwise, no, it's, it's, I feel like it's what, as a person who, as people who should, you know, strive to take care of other people is kind of what we, everybody should do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll keep using this one. Did I learn anything from almost losing my life? Uh, drink more water. Honestly, um, 
I learned something though that I suspected for a very long time. Like, uh, I'm not afraid to die. I have no fear of death. Um, but I have an extreme fear of pain. That is what I learned. Like, um, when I was in the hospital over the summer and like I am in a room in the middle of the night full of people who are actively working to save my life and it's 10 people in a hospital very small hospital room that I'm sharing you know with another patient uh, and these people like it's the intensive care like they call I can't remember what they call them, but they're like the emergency inside the hospital people and all these people are working on me putting like inserting needles and x-raying and putting electrodes on me and giving me blood transfusion and they're freaking out and i am calm i am so calm i'm asking questions i'm like yo what is that what's my blood type did you guys start the transfusion yet how low is it and they're answering and they are freaking out and i'm calm yes my heart rate is at 200 beats per minute and my blood pressure is at 60 over whatever you know but I'm calm. They're like, you, they, you're you losing blood. We can't find it. We don't know where it's going. And I am not freaking out the whole time. Like, and it wasn't because I was on, you know, drugs to keep me sedated. You know, I was past that point in my treatment. I was just like, huh, this is curious. This is interesting. This is, you know, I can't breathe right now, but and, and I'm real clammy. This is interesting. I'm not in pain, so I'm not I'm not concerned. I probably should be concerned because everybody else is real concerned. I can see through their masks and how they're scurrying around. But, you know, hey, if I if I die right now, I die right now. There's nothing really I can do about it. What, you know, hey, I don't think I'm going to die in the hospital, but if it happens, it happens. And even it took me probably two weeks after this incident to be like, I'm sitting at home like, I almost died like and I don't know how I feel about that because I wasn't scared I like even days later like because I was in the hospital for eight days um even days later the nurses you know come back on rotation they're talking to my fiance like he is he is way too laid back like I like coming into his room because he he is so laid back. Like, if he makes a mess, he apologizes. <laughs> you know, like, you know, we always tell him, no, don't worry. But, like, he's not calling for pain pills all the time. He just kind of hangs out. Like, I mean, what else are you supposed to do in the hospital? You know? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Watch TV, read a book if you can. Just chill until they tell you you can go home. You know? walk when they tell me to walk eat when i'm allowed to because i wasn't allowed to eat or drink just be in there i didn't feel like you know being on the phone couldn't draw you know like just yeah just i just want to know when i can go home that's all i want to know so i'm gonna just hang out patiently and watch martin reruns or whatever the hell is on tv so I can go. I haven't seen TV with commercials in a while. This is my thinking. So I would just watch this regular cable TV they got and see what they're selling in the world. And all they're selling was medicine and food, <laughs> which is funny. But yeah. And I know that's entirely tangential, tangential to the question, but yeah, I mean, I'm not afraid to die. It's it's not really a scary thing because you know it's it's something that's gonna happen. It's pointless to be afraid of it. It's like being afraid of breathing <laughs> or your heart beating. Can you imagine? Ah, uh, getting these bottoms clear. What was life like when I wasn't able to draw for eight days? I wasn't able to draw for longer than eight days. So eight days in the hospital. And before that, months before, six days in the hospital, they both had, they both had the same effect on my uh, creative output. So like in the hospital, I couldn't draw because I'm sitting on a, I'm in a bed and I am attached 
to several machines um, so I don't get infection and so I don't get blood clots. I'm also attached to several IVs, which they had to IV me over and over and over again. So I really wasn't as mobile as I wanted to be. Like I, if I wanted to take a walk, you know, I had to call in a nurse so they could unplug me from the wall basically. Um, and they didn't want me falling. Like I couldn't even sit up. So it was in the hospital. Oh, okay. Not a big deal. I couldn't draw. Once I got home, not being able to draw was very strange because I couldn't sit down to concentrate on drawing. Like I didn't have any good ideas or even a bad ideas. Like my hands didn't want to do, my brain didn't want to do. I didn't just want to sit there. And like for me, drawing is what I do at any possible moment. I don't need, I don't get art is block or whatever. Like, yeah, you know, I, it, so it was, it was like, it was very interesting because at the time, at this last, this last time, I had commissions. Like I had people waiting on work from me. And it was like, honestly, two months where I just didn't feel like doing anything. Like maybe playing some video games, watching TV. I read some, but like my brain was in a weird, place where I couldn't concentrate on the lines and then I'm like what am I going to draw because I don't want to feel the pressure of trying to get this you know this work done this work turned in for these people because it's not going to be as good as it could be and I need to get back to I need I, you know I, they, there is a certain level that I expect from myself that they're not necessarily expecting, but you know, there's you know, there's a certain mark I want to hit, and I know that I'm not gonna hit this mark right now. And I talk to some people like they're checking in, like when am I gonna get my work? I'm like, yo, oh, I can't do anything right now. I can't even draw a, well, I can draw a stick figure, but I can't, I can't draw a figure right now. So, you know, I, I'm sorry. It's just. It, I think the medicine and surgery is taking more of a toll than I expected. And most people were cool with it, you know, because when I finally do deliver, they tend to be extremely happy with what they get. It's, and then it's very, very, very nice to work with people who understand that you're going through stuff. Oh, man. Gotta change this. I got a little... A little dirty wordy on the cloth. These things that you say. TikTok, you got these from? get my sister-in-law <laughs> to look them up for me because she stays on TikTok. As an artist, how do I protect my mental health? It's, it's, um, well, I used to have a person I spoke to every single week uh, through a program uh, that is, that I got through DC Behavioral Services. Oops. Um, and that gave me some strategies to move forward but like honestly as an artist it's difficult because your art what you're doing especially if you're like you're an artist like me who like just lives and breathes art and sees the connections everywhere um, your art can be extremely tied into your self worth it is a self-expression hopefully not just a money grab like it is for some people it's a self-expression and you know trying to there are many paths and artists can take to you know try to make a living some people you know they they draw and i try to sell directly to public others try to take the path with your museums and galleries and shows like this which means you have to be picked you have to be chosen and chosen sometimes you never know what it is. Is it the quality of the art that you're making? 
or is it you as a person and you can sometimes like take too much on yourself thinking like you're the problem or your art is the problem when that's not the case it's just the people you know aren't you're not taking you know you're not taking into account what they got going on with them so it can be there are times when I'm like, uh, I'm terrible, I'm suck, why do I bother doing this? Nobody likes what I do. I'm working hard and I'm toiling in the dark. I'm like, it's like I'm going to the gym and I'm bench pressing world records and nobody knows I'm doing it. And the few people who know, they're like, that's cool, but they don't get it. So why am I even, what's the point of me lifting a million pounds if no one knows that I can lift a million pounds? And I'm like, call me because I'm ready to lift this million pounds. And I'm like, nah, we got it. We got five people who can lift, you know, a quarter of a million pounds. Um, so we're going to go with them. Like, it can be, it can be a little mentally stressful. But having a support system, no matter how big or small, someone who can bring you back down to reality helps me. Helps me quite a bit. I think I'm done with these, uh these puppies yeah I'm done with the done with the mumra does the world make space for artists you know <laughs> yes they do and no they don't and how okay how do you answer this question how do I mean so art is literally a part of everybody's everyday life the hard part about that is letting, making someone, helping someone realize that they are living in among art and the product of artists at all times. Um, perfect example is what we have right in front of us. This right here is the product of several artists. Yes, committee, but the first artist who ever drew the design of a shoe like this, because not shoes didn't always look have this shape and weren't always tennis shoes. That is an artist. The first person who ever drew an animated cartoon, a mummy that is a villain, an artist. The person who decided to put these things together, choose the colors, all that, art, like the, the presentation of it, artist. The table that we're like, have this stuff on, artist, designer. Like the, the, the way our cameras look, the way our watches look, tattoos, buildings, cars, artists, not just paintings on walls, you know? So the world, yes, creates space for artists, but when there's a person who's like, I wanna do art, that is something you just look at. It gets a little, depending on the part of the world or where in the world you live, even in the city you live, there's some space made for it, there's some that's not. Um, if your story is that you're from a family that is supposed to work, then there's not necessarily made space for art by that family. So you have to know this is like, and then you got to go and find and make the, find the places where they are making this space for it. There are some people who do realize that those paintings that go on walls or even the music we listen to need people to create those things because they make our life so much better. They create texture, flavor that we may not know we're picking up on, but we are always picking up on. They are always influencing us. Um, so like I say, yes and no, yes and no. Uh, I guess I should do the, the other shoes. Yeah. Uh, ho -ho. Getting down to the sock feet. <laughs> make fun of my ashy ankles what makes an everyday sneaker an everyday sneaker for me it is the one i literally put on every day it's the one that i keep next to the door there is no i don't know what the box is anymore you know what i'm saying like i don't care about the shape it's comfortable uh this used to be a gym shoe um this like this was exclusively i'm going to the gym i'm going to the treadmill I'm going to work out on this. I'm going for a walk in this. But, you know, after I had to, I think it was post-surgery, 
where these went from like my everyday's were Air Force One low tops, black Air Forces. People thought something about me. <laughs> Are you out here jacking? Nah, I just like, I like these Air Forces, but they're not like, once I couldn't ride my motorcycle anymore because of, you know, surgery, I needed something I could walk around the city in. And I don't know if you know this, but Air Force Ones, high or low, are not the greatest shoes for walking two, three miles of the cliff. So, I still love my Air Forces. I still got them. Um, my black Air Forces, they're paint splattered and everything from the studio. But, you know, these became by default, like I needed something to be able to be on my feet at work in and walk up and down the street. And these are just so comfortable and they breathe and they're so flexible and like, it's just like, eh. Plus I like, I like the design and the color. Um, yes, they've gotten some paint on them. Acrylic paint is not the easiest to come out. Got some road grind, but yeah, I've squashed the, the cushioning, because when I first put them on, it felt like I was bouncing on air. It's a lovely feeling. And these shoes were given to me as a Christmas gift by my fiance. Usually like, new shoes are like somebody will be like, you need some new shoes. I I, I don't buy shoes like I used to because I'm, I'm a, a recovering sneakerhead, believe it or not. What does it mean to be a recovering sneakerhead? For me, it means that I don't, as soon as I get paid, go to the store and buy like that dope ass limited edition colorway of this high top that I like that has a matching truffles. Let me try one. I'm not buying like the matching, uh, the shoes that have the matching watch with the matching hoodie uh, slash free t-shirt giveaway thing anymore. Um, especially cause like, I know people like, you know, there's, and this was before there was the hype beast thing. Uh, <laughs> which is funny to me, like, when I was a kid, my parents didn't buy me shoes I liked. So, you know, like my first pair of Nikes came from my gym coach who my first and second pair of Nikes came from my gym teacher in seventh grade, who he was out, he was like, this kid is wearing Chuck Taylors when nobody was wearing Chuck Taylors. Everybody had, you know, like Jordans were still, Jordan was still playing. My gym teacher was giving me Nikes because my parents weren't buying for me. And I would always go to the store and see all these cool shoes. Like I used to want the, uh, I used to want to, uh, Grandma my shoes, the, you know, I used to want the, the pumps, I wanted the light, I want all the cool gimmicks. My parents would never buy them, because it cost money. <laughs> so as soon as I got to a point where I could, I did. And I have a special love for Pumas and Adidas. And because they are not Nike, they do, you know, before the whole yay thing, they were doing things on the design side that was just crazy. Like I used to have the, the like the ones that look like the Jamaican flag, um, Adidas. I used to have like my favorite color is blue. So I would have like blue with tiger gold. Like just, I have a different color for every outfit and I'm not the most colorful shoe wear all the time but I had shoes you got to a point where I was um I had my closet full of shoes and all my underbed area like I started like I, I haven't worn this pair of shoes and whatever whatever I had three different styles of low top white sneakers from a Pumas indeed is like the Ducati version the this version of that version like I couldn't even match shoes like I like I need white shoe I grab one grab one It'd be two different brands like oh they look so similar so I just started cutting shoes out like I pulled together a pile just for shoes from under my bed that I hadn't worn in like months that was probably ankle high across my bedroom floor just in piles shoes I would walk through shoes like 
if I found a pair of shoes that I like that was a good every day, I'll walk it until like I'll walk holes through it, walking in these DC streets, keep them. So it got to a point just like, I just need room and I need to get rid of shoes. And so I just stopped buying them like that. And I, you know, now I live in a 500 square foot with my partner and closet space is a premium. So we can't, you know, I got to choose 500 square feet with the two of us. So yeah, yeah. 500 square feet with three closets. So there is a time every few months where there is a purge done. I And I, because I come from what they call a scarcity mindset, and when you live in a scarcity mindset, you tend to hold on to everything. That's how hoarders are created. And I come from a tr strong tradition of pack rats. I will hold on to stuff. Like, I have this. You haven't worn this shirt in three years. Like, but I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it because I like it. When I tell you you know, you, you and I, we met because of our mutual love of t-shirts and working next door to each other. When I tell you I have storage containers full of t-shirts that I cannot let go of, full, bro. And not the ones I made, ones I purchased. And I tend not to wear shirts that I, per like, I, I tend to wear shirts I make these days. So like, she's always like, you sure you want to keep these? Like, I'm keeping it. Cause I don't know, <laughs> like I may not have a word again, but I don't know, like I can't get rid of it. Yeah, so shoes, yeah, because shoes, you can't really roll up and tuck under the bed. You can't vacuum seal shoes. So I have to be very selective with the shoes I, I get and keep. So I can't be a, a sneaker head like I used to be. That's why I'm real happy about these mum rhymes. Matter of fact, I'm gonna move them to the, oh, I not you like that, oh. Huh? Move to the side because I don't want them to get re wet. What does community mean to me? Community means the group of people that you live, work, and play amongst. Um, your village, basically. And your village can be familiar or un. It can be extremely familiar, almost familial, or it can be associate, but it's still your village. You know, like. You have interactions with people that you might not necessarily even see their face, but you know, you, most people aren't aware of this, your presence affects their life, right? Like, perfect example is the people we drive among every day. Um, yeah, that's, that's what community means to me. Uh, it'll be composed of, like I say, work associates, family, neighbors, people that live in city with you. People who have to share spaces with you, public or private. The people you serve or on a regular basis as a service member, service industry member, or people you drink with, you know? And that's what that's what community means to me. And what's funny is sometimes there's communities inside of communities or you'll find yourself in a community that you didn't don't realize you're a part of until someone points it out to you. Or you could be trapped in a community that you think is the whole world, which is, but it really isn't. Perfect example is service industry. Things that we understand and take for granted uh, to the outside world or a person who has never been in the service industry just don't get. <laughs> So yeah. Yeah, this thing said be gentle. It's it's you know how it is when you have a certain level of uh strength <laughs> and you don't know it <laughs> until you poke a hole through a wall accidentally or, <laughs> or you bruise your partner <laughs> cuz you just wanted to hold her hand. <laughs> There's a little bit of A and a little bit of B. And so when you're young and impressionable and some people are impressionable their entire lives and mentally young, their community chooses them. 
they may think they're choosing their community, but their programming makes the choices for them. When you get older or a bit more mature and are making conscious choices or making efforts to make more conscious choices, then you tend to choose your community a bit more. But most of us don't choose our families. Our families are circumstance of birth or adoption. However, you you know came through the family that raised you, if you are blessed enough to be raised by a family. Uh, my everyday shoes say about me. What do my everyday shoes say about me? They say that I am loyal to a fault because these shoes probably should have been retired months ago. I'm not going to say years ago, but 100% months ago. I have, you know, these are these are trainers, so they need traction and tread, especially if I need to make quick moves or anything like that. And the bottoms are completely smooth, right? <laughs> uh, the 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 part, the sole that's supposed to give you the bounce back reflect action to make it easier to move around, has been walked down so far. Like you can, it looks stressed right now. <coughs> like I have. My heel hit so hard it has impacted it to the point where all of that is gone. It's just, right now it's just a wrapping for my foot. Like I say, it's still flexible, it's still great, it's light, easy to use. I can slip right into it, slip right out of it. I like it. You know, the colors make it easy to choose most outfits. They're great for behind the bar because the bar has mats and everything. But, you know, I probably should get a different, I should probably get a new shoe, but I like this shoe. It hasn't, you know, hasn't done me wrong yet. Not yet. You know, nobody's made fun of me for them yet, so. <laughs> There's that too. Plus, I have a hard time letting go. Like I said before, I have these pack rat tendencies. I have also have a hard time letting go of things people gift me. Um, I think that might be one of my love languages, re giving and receiving gifts. So... The shoe, the, the exercise Nikes I had before this were also a gift, not the Air Force Ones. Uh, they were a gift given to me by a terrible ex-girlfriend. And I wore those shoes until they fell apart because they were a gift. <coughs> Regardless of the person that gave them to me, they were a gift, you know? <laughs> So yeah, like I'm I'm very strange about that. That also comes into play when it's time to do a purge in the apartment. Cause I'll take some gifts and I'll try to find use of them, but I try not to get rid of them. And then you know, the, the, the fiance, she's like, "You, we don't have space for you to keep this." <laughs> but it was a gift. <laughs> Somebody went out of their way to give it to me or buy it for me and bring it to me. So what? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Wow. These things are dope. I was wondering why I was dragging my foot. <laughs> for at least a week. I was wondering why I was dragging my foot. <laughs> Wow. Wow. It's funny as I use those in my studio to uh, keep paintings on the wall. <laughs> I have a lot of them touches lying on the ground these days. And I know the exact moment that that thumbtack ended up in my heel. I was stepping up on a ladder to put a painting up high on the wall. You know, back in the old apartment, I used thumb tacks, I use regular tacks, and I use the M3M strips, the 3M hooks. I use a lot of 3M hooks because one, I couldn't go into the walls, they were too hard, and two, I didn't want to leave little holes in the wall in case I was going to get my security deposit back, but I don't think that's ever going to happen, so whatever. They can clean up the walls themselves. Once I got paint on the hardwood floor, I was pretty much, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, in the studio, thumbtacks, thumbtacks, thumbtacks. Only thing that sucks is when the heads break off or when they're clear and you step on them. 
I discovered that I probably should look at my shoes that I wear a lot, a little bit more every day, instead of like, yes, being loyal to them, but for taking for granted that there's not a piece of glass or a nail sticking in the sole that could probably work its way into the bottom of my foot at some point. Uh, yeah, um, and that, <coughs> yes, these are worn and a bit dirty, but not nearly as bad as I thought they would have been since I've literally never attempted to clean these. There's some stains on here that I enjoy, um, like the paint stains. I'm this weirdo, like, when I'm painting and I, like, for two or three days have paint still on my arms and hands or I get paint in my hair or the coveralls I now use to paint with, I feel good. I like it. Um, and if somebody, if anybody ever asks, I can be like, because I'm, I'm an artist and I was working on something, you know, this is just paint goes places it does you know it, it paint gonna paint you know what i'm saying uh, it's a thing i also learned these shoes have a an interesting pattern that i never <coughs> never seen before like a gave it a little like a texture built into the design that is most people would never pay attention to. It's very cool. Like it's a little, it looks like either rocks or fake crocodiles, like patterns right in this little strip that's nowhere else on each shoe. That's pretty cool. Oh my, how would I define love? That, <clears throat> how does anybody define love? Uh, uh, can I Google this? <laughs> Uh, that's a tough one because love is different for everybody. Um, it's an emotion. Uh, and for me, it is a state of being, I believe. Like, so there's this, like, okay, so we got this concept of gratitude and appreciation. Like, to me, love is an extreme, extreme form of that. Like, it's like a, a type of warmth and gratitude. There's also like a cutting to it, but it's like a type of gratitude that has no limits and drives you to action, certain actions. And then, of course, you know, there's different types of love. Are we talking about platonic? Are we talking about romantic? Are we talking about, you know what I'm saying? Like, are we talking about, like, I love this movie, but I don't want to marry it. You know, it's... Love is fluid and works on the spectrum. Um, and, and, and my version of love might not be the same as anybody else's version of love. Like, to me, love is trying to be as authentically myself as I possibly can for other people that's yeah that's what it means to me yeah if I love some person that means I am really really being me and I am very good at not being me I actually have a degree in not being me so yeah <laughs> love is a state of being man it stated in it and it it uh it is composed of many acts and it's composed of many actions but it is a state of being that's yeah at least that's how i see it uh it's like one of those uh energies that can never be it cannot be created nor destroyed it just changes states it always is. You can chase it. You can fall in it. You can find it. You know. But it's always around. Yeah. So it's, it's more than just the action. They will be replaced. Um, I don't have.
have plans like like I said before do I have plans on replacing my everyday speaker sneaker they will be replaced I don't know when they will be replaced and I don't go shoe shopping anymore um, the closest I come to shoe shopping these days is social media like I found the Thundercat shoes and I have two pairs of them that have the mumber on the Thundercat on social media and I'm like oh my god and they're limited oh my god I will never get these I want them and I don't know if I'll ever have them but I'm going to send this link to my fiance to show her this is the kind of thing I like so she knows and then sometimes these things arrive and sometimes they don't or you know she looks at my shoes and go yeah Trey you need new shoes because these are falling apart and they don't work for me anymore and then new shoes show up so they will be replaced but I don't know when and right now they're working uh, they're doing exactly what I need them to do which is you know be my carriage as Bob Marley would say and then when I start riding my motorcycle again, there's going to be a different pair of dailies because these are not appropriate for riding a motorcycle. Uh, not in the slightest amount. So, you know, what I'm doing often dictates what is my everyday, as well. excuse me, as well. Eesh. This, with my health being what it is, how has my life changed since the surgery? Well, first, biggest change is that I cannot, I have not been able to ride my motorcycle for a year. And um, I am a daily motorcycle guy. Well, I was a daily motorcycle guy. Like, I was a dude who, when I worked at the motorcycle shop and I was there for five years until I dropped it to get out of a toxic environment and pursue my artistic self more, would ride in with black ice, snowstorms, year round like sometimes i would get calls from work to tell me to not ride my motorcycle to work because of the weather like riding a motorcycle like imagine working at a place that sells and repairs motorcycles that is what they do and sells motorcycle lessons and gear like life is about bikes to call an employee to tell them not to ride their motorcycle i was that guy like you know, people will come into the shop and be like, oh, it's getting cold, I can't ride, I can't get a bike, and I'll be like, everybody, every salesman on the floor would look right at me and go, you see that guy? He rides every day. He rode today. It's 20 degrees outside. You have no excuses. <laughs> people come to me like, you rode? That's your bike? I'm like, yeah. I mean, gee. So that's, that's a big thing. And then the other thing is, and I know you'll feel this one, um, and hopefully this never happens to you, but like, I asked my doctor when I could lift weights, like when I can lift something. And he's like, just for fun? And I said, I mean, I used to. And he's like, probably never again. Uh, you know, um, that hurt because I used to live in the gym a little bit. You know, and I always figured I could get back to, you know, kind of doing that. I'll never be as big and as strong as I used to be, but I still need to, I, I like to do stuff to keep my body moving. And like, basically my entire exercise life has been walking on the treadmill. Like in hospital last time, not only did I discover I can't lift heavy weights because of the surgeries, I discovered I have a heart condition, which means I can't play competitive sports and I can't run, I can't sprint. So I can maybe jog, but right now, I can't even lift 50 pounds. <laughs> like 20 pounds, 25 pounds in that range is what I'm working up to. So those things like, which means that I went from used to being used to being one of the strongest people around that I knew um, you know, aside from you, uh, like knowing like if anybody ran up on me in a situation, I'd be ready to throw them across the street or, you know, like this one time my dad needed help moving a piano. There were three of us and I carried one end of the piano by myself to like watching my girlfriend have to carry groceries because I can't or every time we travel and she's not my girlfriend anymore she's my fiance but like every time we travel not being able to carry the suitcases because 
Like, that's weird. It makes me feel strange. I know it's a little bit of like that, you know, masculine expectation that society has imposed upon us, um, which I don't, you know, the gender norms I don't necessarily uh, subscribe to anymore, but it still feels strange. You know? <laughs> I mean, like, I got this. Nah, it's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> How much was that? 100 pounds? Yeah, that's easy. <laughs> like, to, ooh, that looks heavy. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I can't. <laughs> so those are the biggest changes uh, with this health situation. It, that that is, has been the, the hardest part to take. Hmm. Yeah, this shoe's got a lot of pain on it. How do I protect my mental health these days? Self-check, rigorous self-check. And like I say, sometimes I am not as uh, good at it as I used to be, but I have a partner who can remind me or who, once I can finally admit to myself that I am struggling with something, and say it out loud then she can affirm that like uh and sometimes it's hard to protect when you don't know you need to protect when you're not aware you need to protect like you'll find yourself or i'll find myself in the middle of uh the not best emotional or mental health place but because of strategies that i received while i was talking to someone weekly i can recognize triggers and then start trying to parse out why is this what can I do um, yeah do is this serving me there is like there there's something happening that I need to think about and address and talk about so yeah protection um, sometimes you just need to be affected and sometimes you don't and it's just figuring out and discerning which is is that time you know like it is important to be, I have learned, or I learned, it is important to be emotional. It is important to be upset and happy and the things in between um, the other states. It's, it's okay to be angry, but also understand why. And how that and, and, and understand then not allow it to negatively impact you or too negatively impact you, you know? Uh, sorry, I'm finding my fiance's hairs in my shoes. Which <laughs> I think these are as uh, as clean as they're gonna get. they need to dry a little bit too what does it mean to have a friend mm -hmm. um, for me if having a friend means a person that I can combine in and a person that I can just be around just be around and that person that I can talk to um, they they could take a lot you know you could put a lot on a friend but not too much and be real with them and hopefully you know they be real with you that is what it means to me to have a friend It's, uh, it's pretty cut and dry for me, like, just a person that you can hang out with and just be a goof. This is a day in my shoes.